Will Dalvin Cook end up as a member of the New York Jets? We talk about that and so much more coming up next here on this Monday edition of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into another edition of the Locked On NFL Podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. It is Monday. That means you have me, Kevin Ostriker, one of the many NFL experts here on our network. We're free and available on all podcasting platforms, including over in video form on YouTube. So you can subscribe for free, both in video form and in audio form. In today's episode of Locked On NFL is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, official sportsbook of the NFL. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. We're back here another week bringing you the biggest stories throughout the NFL, although there's not really a ton happening right now. Still storylines to get into in the first part of the show. We'll talk with John Butchko of Locked On Jets about Dalvin Cook potentially going to New York. I know there are the Patriots rumors. Seems like it could be an AFC East team with the Jets or the Patriots or the Dolphins. We'll talk with John about the Jets, though, in Dalvin Cook. Then in the second part of the show, we'll talk with Ross Jackson of Locked On Saints about just how to feel about a Saints team that feels like there is some bounce back potential there. Then finally, me being the host of Locked On Ravens, I will take you through the Ravens and if they're poised to take back the AFC North from the Cincinnati Bengals. So without any further ado, let's first hop into our conversation with John Butchko of Locked On Jets. Well, the Jets have had no shortage of storylines this offseason from Aaron Rodgers. Now here to Dalvin Cook potentially signing with the team. Here to talk about that with me, John Butchko, the host of Locked On Jets. And John, I know it's been a very busy offseason for you. The Jets revamping their offense to the quarterback position, but now maybe the running back position get, getting a bit of a boost. I know this is Brees Hall's room, but with him coming off the injury, maybe the Jets want some insurance there. Has there been anything you've maybe heard about Dalvin Cook possibly coming to the Jets that maybe gives you hope that he could sign with the team? You know, it's always difficult to say because I think when a guy's a free agent, he gets linked with any number of teams. And the Jets have been like, the Jets were sure linked with a lot of people this offseason. And of them, Aaron Rodgers was really the only one who ended up coming. I I think you hit on the key point is that Brees Hall is the top back for this team, but he is coming off a serious injury. And one thing I've said pretty consistently on Locked On Jets through the course of the offseason is I think the Jets are going to want to be very cautious with his recovery because he was a critical player on this team last year. They started at five and two. And a big part of that was Brees Hall had a phenomenal first half of the season. And if you look at when they kind of fell off, it was exactly right at the point where he got injured. Cause they started at five and two, they were on a four game winning streak. And then from that point forward, they won two games the rest of the season. Now, part of that was the quarterback play was not very good. Darren Rodgers are expecting a bit better quarterback play this year uh, to put it mildly, but I think that they're going to want to make sure they're preserving Brees Hall. They're going to want to make sure Brees Hall is fresh. You know, coming off these serious knee injuries, sometimes what you see is even when a guy is cleared medically to play, he's not exactly himself at first. And so I think the Jets are kind of trying to figure out how to get to that November, December range where they can really use Brees Hall full time. So I think a Dalvin Cook, from that standpoint, could make sense because he's an older guy. I don't think you're going to want to give Dalvin Cook 300 carries. But you, you may be able to be the guy who's kind of the lead back early in the season, take the pressure off Brees, and then late in the season you can kind of turn the offense back over to Brees Hall in the run game. Yeah, and that, that would make a lot of sense. But, John, if this isn't meant to be, if Dalvin Cook doesn't sign with the Jets, what does the room look like behind Brees Hall right now? It's interesting because running back's always kind of a young man's position. And there are kind of, like, kind of two, two schools of thought here. The first school of thought is Dalvin Cook's a proven commodity. If you look at what he did last year, maybe it not be vintage Dalvin Cook. He's still a productive player. He's still got speed. He's still got big playability. On the other hand, the, the, there is a th- thought process that you always want to go younger at running back. You want to go cheaper. There's always some guy who, who could step up. So behind Brees Hall right now for the Jets, they have a couple guys who are interesting. Now, there's Michael Carter, who was a fourth-round pick two years ago, had a good rookie season, and then really no other way to put it, a disaster year two. He was benched down the stretch. When Brees Hall went down, everybody – around the Jets thought, well, Carter's going to do the lead back, and he eventually played himself out of that role. 
after him are two kind of intriguing young players. One, one is Bam Knight, who came up off the practice squad late last season. First three games would look really good. He, he looked like a, potentially what I was talking about, that young guy who kind of emerges out of nowhere and then kind of fell off. But the Jets run blocking also wasn't great. So how much of it was Bam Knight? How much of it was just the run blocking? They also have a day three pick this year, Izzy Abanaconda out of Pittsburgh. And you never, I, I know you never want to count on a day three rookie to do much, but I do think running back is one of the few spots where you could say, okay, that's a legitimate uh, spot where maybe something can happen. And what a Banaconda brings, he brings some big playability. He's got good speed. So at the running back position, I think, you know, my general view is the first couple of yards are pretty much contingent on the offensive line. Where running backs to me add value are, can they break off big runs? And is he a Banaconda with his speed? Could be a guy who could, who, who, has the potential to be a big play threat in the NFL. Yeah, big playability in that position is incredibly valuable, especially in today's game. But, John, I want to flip over to defense quickly, ask you about the switch, I guess, at the safety position from Chuck Clark over to Adrian Amos. As Chuck Clark suffers a torn ACL, a really unfortunate injury for a guy that's been so durable, came over from Baltimore in an offseason trade. They signed Adrian Amos pretty much immediately after the news broke that there was potentially an injury there. What are the Jets losing in Chuck Clark, and what are they getting in Adrian Amos? All right, well, let me correct you on the time frame here, Kevin, because the Adrian Amos uh, signing gets announced. I recorded an episode of Locked on Jets where I'm talking about, this is great. We're going to have all these three safety looks with Clark and Amos. Like five minutes after I post the episode, the news breaks that, that Clark, oh. Clark is out for the season. So maybe the shortest shelf life of an episode of um, Locked on Podcasts that we've ever seen. Um, I, I like the signing of Adrian Amos. Like I, I liked it before the Chuck Clark injury because I thought, you know, maybe you see some three safety looks from the Jets along with, Jordan Whitehead, I liked the Chuck Clark trade a lot. I thought he's a, a really good player. I thought the Jets made a good deal. Like they, they only gave up a seven to Baltimore to get him. I thought he was going to upgrade the uh, the safety position for the Jets. But I think Adrian Amos is a good fill-in. He's a guy who's you know all coming off a down season, and it's always a bit of a red flag when you're on the wrong side of thirty. So little concern there. But a guy who's been really solid player, a guy who's kind of been a fill in the blanks type of safety. He's played effectively in the box. He's played effectively deep. He's been a decent cover guy, decent uh, run stopper. And the one thing that gives me some solace about the Chuck Clark injury, and I think you saw it play out in this Amos signing, there are certain spots where there's just always a guy available. And for whatever reason, you can always find a decent safety available even this time of year. There's always some guy out there who's who you can get for like $4 million. And they just I think there's just it's one of those spots where there's a lot of quality in this league. There may not be a lot of the high impact guys, there may not be a lot of superstar safeties, but there's always, there's a lot of decent safeties who can at least prevent a position from being a dire need. So I think the Jets did well. I mean, I'm very disappointed to lose Chuck Clark, who I thought was going to be really good, but I think the Jets did well to find a replacement as quickly as they did in Adrian Amos. Yeah, and, and to your point, last thing here, John, is with, you know, you being so excited for those three safety looks, would you want to see the Jets go out there and maybe bring another safety in to maybe make those dreams come a reality? Well, I think what's good, what may happen now is they might be a little bit more inclined to bring back a linebacker, Quan Alexander. And I think maybe less three safety looks. I think now maybe more conventional looks with three linebackers out there. They have CJ Mosley under contract. They have Quincy Williams, who they, who they just re-signed. So now I think I think that might, role might be played by a third linebacker. My eyes on Quan, Quan Alexander, who was a late signing last year. He was a guy they, all, they signed in the summer of 2022 and who played well in that third linebacker role. So one of the things I mentioned on that, you know, show, the podcast with the five minute shelf life was maybe we'll see less three linebacker looks and more three safety looks. I think we're going to see three linebacker looks from the Jets. Big shout out to John for talking Dalvin Cook, talking Jets. And for more on John's work, be sure to check out the Locked On Jets podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network here, your team every day. Coming up in the second part of the show, Ross Jackson of Locked On Saints will join us as we talk about the feelings surrounding the Saints team and how we should feel about them. So be sure to stay tuned. Plenty to talk about on Locked On NFL. But first, this episode is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook. And baseball season is in full swing, and there's no better place to get in on the action than FanDuel, America's number one sportsbook. Because right now, new customers get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000. says up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to join today. And look, me being a Baltimore, being a Ravens guy, an Orioles guy as well, and they're on a tear. They just called up one of their top prospects. But Adley Rushman has been obviously one of their star players 
players. Gunnar Henderson's been on a tear. They need they need some pitching. But if you want to bet Orioles props or any other MLB props, do it over at FanDuel Sportsbook. So don't miss a chance to snag a no sweat first with up to one thousand dollars when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel official partner of Major League Baseball. Major League Baseball chain RC user permission. We are back here, locked on NFL Monday style. Kevin Ostriker is still here with you. We just talked with John Butchko of Locked On Jets. We're going to flip over to the NFC now with Ross Jackson of Locked On Saints. The Saints are such an interesting team to me. I wanted to get Ross on here to talk about just how everyone should feel about them heading into 2023 after they had a bit of a down year, admittedly, in 2022. So let's talk about that now with Ross. So the New Orleans Saints are a very interesting team to monitor for the 2023 season. Here to break everything Saints related down with me is Ross Jackson, the host over at Locked On Saints. And Ross, it was such a weird year for the Saints last year. Quarterback <laughs> uncertainty and just they weren't super good. You know, this it was a down year for them. And I want to get your feelings right now about how everybody else, you know, you're in depth with the team, you cover them. How should everyone be feeling about a Saints team that does have some bounce back potential this year? Yeah, here's what I'll say. The New Orleans Saints of 2023 will be greatly improved from what you saw in 2022. That's my biggest takeaway around this team right now. After spending time with them during OTAs and mini camps, being at practices, being in the locker room, it's vastly different at this time this year than it was at this time last year during those same portions of the phase three of the offseason. Now we have to see what happens when it all gets out onto the field, what happens with training camp, but now with Derek Carr at the helm, Michael Thomas back, we'll see what happens with Alvin Kamara, but they've added a lot of talent on the offensive side of the ball. They've restored some talent over on the defensive side of the ball while maintaining some of their veteran leadership over there. This is a team that should still be a very defensive first team that's looking to keep teams under 23 24 25 points and uh an offense that should be able to to put up some points and move the ball which they had a lot of trouble doing last year whether it was Jameis Winston or Andy Dalton at quarterback this New Orleans Saints team in 2023 is going to be much better at least it is right now on paper from what it was in 2022. Yeah, and the headliner has obviously been Derek Carr after going mm-hmm. back and forth between Jameis Winston and Andy Dalton and just figuring out who's the guy going to be. Derek Carr gives them that stability. How has he fit in so far based off of what you've seen at OTAs and minicamp and how he's doing with the team so far? Yeah, he's been a great fit so far. Uh, just to add to your list there, the New Orleans Saints, Jameis Winston, Andy Dalton, but also Trevor Simeon. Taysom Hill, even Ian Book started a game for them. And so the post Drew Brees collapse at quarterback was very real very quickly. But the New Orleans Saints identified very early in the offseason that Derek Carr was the guy that they wanted. Of course, Derek and uh, head coach Dennis Allen have a pre-existing relationship. Dennis Allen drafted Derek Carr and made him the rookie starter when he was with the then Oakland Raiders uh, back a few years ago or back years ago. And so now you get both of those guys back together in a very similar system that uh, you know, John Gruden was a part of over in uh, over with the Raiders. And the reason why I highlight John Gruden there is because Gruden and Sean Payton are cut from the same cloth. Back in, I believe it was 1999 in Philadelphia, Gruden was the offensive coordinator. Sean Payton was the uh, quarterback's coach. Sean Payton helped to develop or had helped developing his offensive system based upon what he saw from guys like Bill Parcells, but also John Gruden being a big part of that. Now, there's a lot of embattlement around John Gruden and the reason that he, you know, would kind of resigned in disgrace from the NFL. And none of that deserves to be lessened at all. But the reason why I highlight John Gruden so much is that the system that Derek Carr is walking into here in New Orleans, which is still very much Sean Payton-esque, or at least Sean Payton, Sean Payton built, is very akin to what Derek Carr had some of his best years doing in Las Vegas or with the Raiders, and that was under John Gruden. So I highlight that as, as a means of saying that this system that he is now walking into in New Orleans is far from anything new to him, and it has allowed him to be a really, really good fit uh, walking right in and being able to command this offense right away throughout the offseason. Yeah, really good to feel stability at that position yeah. in New Orleans this year. But a place that might be a little less stable is running back. You mentioned Alvin Kamara there, Ross. And what do you know with the situation is updated as it is based off what's out there? How may how maybe likely is it that Kamara misses some games? You got to turn to a full workload of Jamal Williams, who came in this offseason. Yeah, speaking of Las Vegas, right? Uh, I think <laughs> right. when we look at Alvin Kamara, I think that the reasonable expectation is that he will miss at least six games at some point during the 2023 
season. We'll get a little bit more clarity around that in just a little bit over a month. July 31st is when his trial date is set for that ongoing legal situation with that alleged uh, altercation in uh, Las Vegas centered around the Pro Bowl from just a few years ago. But does that trial date stand? Does it get pushed? Does it get continued like we saw time and time again throughout the season last year when it came to his hearing? The hearing is finally now closed, but then they still have to go to trial. And so the more that they continue to push that, the more they continue to delay that, the less and less likely it will become that Alvin Kamara becomes suspended or serves a suspension in 2023. So it's going to be really interesting to watch that July 31st date. If that holds and the trial happens and a, and you know a decision is made and all these other things, then the NFL can hand down its decision as well. Uh, there's the legal side of this that has to wrap up first before the NFL gets involved. And if I'm Alvin Kamara, I'm more concerned about the legal side of all this because this isn't just a simple charge or a simple, you know, situation that, you know, this is something that could potentially impact Alvin Kamara's life. So we have to watch and see how all that goes. Uh, but, you know, it, it all kind of starts July 31st. If he misses time, though, the Saints are in a really, really good position at the running back position. They brought in Jamal Williams over the course of this offseason. He was the rushing touchdowns leader last year in the NFL. And I know a lot of those touchdowns are in the red zone. But if you look back to Alvin Kamara's double digit touchdown days, most of those came in the red zone, too. It's the it's a big part of being a running back in the NFL is that you happen to get the ball in goal to go uh, you know, one yard, two yard to go situations. That's the way that it works. And so they have him. They drafted the rookie Kendra Miller out of TCU, who they're very excited about. They have Eno Benjamin still on the roster as well, former Arizona State, former uh, – he was with the Houston Texans, with the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, you know, They have a lot, of, a, a lot of different weapons at that running back spot. So either way, they'll be okay at the position. But obviously, if you get Alvin Kamara there and get him in tandem with Jamal Williams, allowing him to – be more of the change of pace back like we saw with him and Mark Ingram in the past and Latavius Murray in the past, that's going to help to open up that game at that running back position quite a bit. Yeah, prepared for sure, whether Kamara misses time or doesn't 100%. there. But I think when talking about uncertainty, Ross, Michael Thomas comes to mind as one of those guys who you just never for know, sure. is he going to be on the field or not? Obviously, he had a really good start to the year last year, but then missed the rest of the season after just a couple of games. What's the latest on him? Is he fully back yet? Is he still missing some time? Is he expected to be ready for the start of the year this year? Yeah, he is expected to be out there week one. And in fact, he's expected to be full go the first day of training camp, which uh, officially is July 26th. So uh, exactly a month from, you know, the our, our Monday locked on NFL here. And so, you know, the, the thing that was a big surprise when it came to Michael Thomas is that he was out there the third week of OTAs. And so he was out there running, you know, running some routes kind of at half speed. He didn't really run anything deep downfield when they needed him to run like a 20 yard route they would start him 15 yards downfield from the quarterback and then he would run five yards and then break and it was just him and the quarterbacks getting some work in and stuff like that but no limp no hardware no braces nothing like that just all Michael Thomas and he's on an incentive heavy deal which means that the more that he produces and the more that he's available the more money he makes that will help to drive some more motivation but I'll tell you what I mean for every Saints fan that wants Michael Thomas to be out there for every Saints fan that misses Michael Thomas being out on the field what I can promise you after speaking with him is that Michael Thomas wants it more and and misses it more than anybody else can that's looking at him from the outside. Yeah, he's a huge and Chris Olave there obviously did a lot mm -hmm. his rookie season. So that duo is really, really nice. But we talked a lot about stars, Ross, Derek Carr, Alvin Kamara, Michael Thomas. But what about some of the under the radar guys who, who impressed you during OTAs during minicamp that fans should keep an eye on? Yeah, I think a lot of folks, even outside of the New Orleans Saints fan base, should be keeping an eye on cornerback Alante Taylor. He's going to be wearing number one this year. So he's got the number one jersey, but he also has a tattoo behind his ear that says, I'm him. Supremely confident guy. Supremely confident. And uh, he's going to be gridlocked in a battle with Paul Sinadivo, third-year cornerback, who was a third-round selection for the Saints back a couple years ago, uh, for the cornerback two-spot opposite star cornerback Marshawn Lattimore. And so that... That battle between Alante Taylor, who is now entering his second year after being drafted the second round out of Tennessee last year, going up against Paulson Adebo is going to be, first of all, one of the highlights of training camp. It's going to be a ton of fun to watch, but also could have some major implications in terms of what this New Orleans Saints defense looks like. He's scrappy. He's young. He is fast. He trusts himself. He's supremely confident. Checks all the boxes that you want for an NFC South corner that usually has to deal with a lot of physical receivers. So he could be a lot of fun to watch and could be one of those big names that comes out of nowhere at some point for the black and gold. 
For us, always bringing the expertise, the Saints analysis as well. And you can catch him over here on Locked On NFL on Tuesdays. And for more on Ross and his work, be sure to check him out on the Locked On Saints podcast or Locked On NFL here, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. We'll round out Locked On NFL in our final part of the show. We will talk about the Ravens and if they can take back the AFC North from the Cincinnati Bengals. So be sure to stay tuned for that. I'll take you through that next on Locked On NFL. We're back here, locked on NFL. Kevin Oshiker still here with you. Thank you so much for being with us here today on this Monday, making us your first listen each and every day, whether you're an everyday or on locked on NFL, or if this is your first time in, or if you sometimes listen, you sometimes don't really appreciate all the support. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and audio form. It is free, no money involved. Here, be sure to tell a friend, tell a family member, word of mouth, still very much a thing here. <laughs> And especially when getting the word out on our podcast, I appreciate that a ton. But let's talk Ravens a little bit now. Me being the Ravens host, I will take you through if the Ravens could take back the AFC North from the Bengals. Now, we talked about this a little bit on Friday show. Former Ravens wide receiver, Super Bowl champion, Kai Gismel, and I talked about it there. But there, there are a bunch of layers that go into it. Because when you talk about divisions that I feel like can really take over the league this year, I think everybody might look. Myself... And what I had to say about that division wasn't necessarily, oh, the AFC North is going to be so good, AFC North, AFC North. I was all on the AFC West. I thought the AFC West was going to be the best division in football. I said it all last offseason. And then what happened? Well, Kansas City won the Super Bowl, but Denver wasn't good. Las Vegas wasn't good. The Chargers, you know, they made the playoffs, but they were one and done after that historic blow lead to the Jaguars in the wild card round. So, all these divisions we talk about in the offseason, you, you have to take it with a grain of salt, right? But the Ravens, the Bengals, the Steelers, and the Browns, those are four teams that I feel like are playoff worthy. And you you take a step back, even just talking about divisions, and look at the conference. I mean, the AFC in particular is the conference this year. The NFC, sure, you have Philadelphia, you have San Francisco, maybe you, you throw Seattle in that conversation. But the AFC is going to be the cream of the crop this year. And when you're talking about teams that could have three teams make the playoffs, the AFC North is one of them. Now, the AFC North is Cincinnati's division, right? They've won it the past two years. Baltimore has had a couple of more Jackson injuries. Pittsburgh has, you know, they've been in it, but, you know, they're kind of a team that you can't count them out because of Mike Tomlin, but how good are they really? And then Cleveland just has to show me something. Their roster, admittedly this year, and it feels like we say, we say this every year, feels like Cleveland is a team that, oh, the roster is the best this year or this year or this year, but then they don't show anything. So to me, they, they have to show me something. But Baltimore, to me, is a team that, look, the offseason, they didn't make a lot of moves early. A lot of people were kind of worried about them. But I feel like now the Ravens have added Odo Beckham. They've added Nelson Aguilar. They drafted Zay Flowers as well. Then you also have the defense where they, they did lose Clayus Campbell. They did lose Chuck Clark, but this is a full year of Roquan Smith. They also added Rocky Asin from the Las Vegas Raiders. So I think the offense and defense have both made solid additions, plus the fact that the offense now has Ted Munkin at the helmet offensive coordinator instead of Greg Roman. Now, the thing that's interesting about when talking about the Ravens taking the division back from Cincinnati is the fact that I feel like the Ravens have almost built their team to match Cincinnati with Joe Burrow, with Jamar Chase, T. Higgins, and Tyler Boyd and all those guys. You're not going to stop them. You have to find a way to just mitigate the damage, make sure it's not as big as it can be. But I feel like we saw when the Ravens played their guys, they only, you know, the last week of the season, the regular season, they didn't play a lot of their guys. But week five, that wild, or not the wild card game, the wild card game was the team they played with Cincinnati. But the week five game in prime time, the Ravens won that game and Joe Burrow looked pretty mortal. Then the wild card game, the Ravens lost it, but they were a Tyler Huntley fumble away from maybe winning that game as there was a huge 14 point swing on that play. So it feels like in those two games, Baltimore found something. Now it's, it's a year to year thing. I'm not saying Baltimore has found out Cincinnati and they found the answers, but it, it did give me a little bit of hope. Now, Cincinnati to their credit added themselves. They did lose Jesse Bates, but they're getting should be a back. Obviously they added Orlando Brown jr. To their offensive line after pretty much revamping the unit last off season. So to me, Cincinnati's a team, look, they are the team to beat in the division. There is no doubt about that in my mind. I have a lot of respect for Cincinnati and what they have done and what they have built. But this is a year-to-year league. I think health also plays a factor in it. And for the most part, Cincinnati has been 
relatively ish healthy. I mean, the year that went to the Super Bowl, they were very, very healthy. Last year dealt with a few more injuries over the course of the year. But for a team like the Ravens, who in 2021, we know what that team went through with J.K. Dobbins and Gus Edwards and Marcus Peters and Lamar at the end of the year and everything. Then the past year, they went through it again with Lamar. It wasn't nearly as bad as it was in 2021, but health plays a huge factor. The Ravens end up letting go of Steve Saunders, who was their strength and conditioning guy. Actually, in that player survey that was run, they ended up getting an F- minus in that category. Steve Saunders got very terrible reviews, so he is gone. Hopefully, that athletic training program will yield healthy results for the team this year. But with Lamar Jackson, you always have a chance. With the high-powered offense, hopefully the weapons surrounding him where you can't just double and triple Mark Andrews. The pass offense doesn't run through the tight ends anymore. Plus, you have J.K. Dobbins, you have Gus Edwards. This division is going to be so competitive this year. I mean, there are going to be plenty of games that come down to the wire in the division. Baltimore and Pittsburgh always play each other close. But here's the thing. Baltimore's schedule, they do not have a lot of room to dilly-dally. They don't have a lot of time to mess around. Three of their first five games this year are AFC North road games. They will be done with all of their AFC North road games, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Pittsburgh. They'll have traveled to each one of those cities and played a football game in the first five weeks of the season. Now, we know how important divisional records are when it comes to you know, winning the division and even conference record when you take a step back, when you talk about wild card seeding, divisional seeding, conference seeding. So to start off with three very tough divisional games on the road, there's going to be a huge challenge, especially for an offense that we we know. Coordinators and teams with new systems, new offensive systems, defensive systems, can take a, take a couple of weeks, take a couple of months to get acclimated to that. We saw it last year firsthand in Baltimore with Mike McDonald being the new defensive coordinator. Took them a couple of weeks to really get acclimated. They lost a couple of games, I think, because of it. But now with this offense, they, they don't have that luxury. Now, the difference between Mike McDonald and Todd Munkin is Mike McDonald, that he was a first-year NFL defensive coordinator. Todd Munkin has NFL experience, and that I think will pay dividends. But to me, Cincinnati and Baltimore are going to be the two teams that fight for this division. Pittsburgh and Cleveland, don't count them out. I'm not counting them out whatsoever. But I feel like this could be the time Baltimore takes it back from Cincinnati. There is also an opportunity for Cincinnati to continue their stranglehold in the division because they have built something really special and have been so good these past couple of seasons. But I think we're going to see two really close games this year between those two teams. And look, with how tight not only the division but the AFC conference is going to be, it could come down to a, to a divisional game here, a conference game there that really determines who wins this division and even who makes it in terms of wild card. Maybe Baltimore misses because of the wild card situation. Maybe Cincinnati misses because of the wild card situation. We'll see how that all plays out for them, but I'm very excited to see how it does because we're going to see a lot of competitive AFC North, that, that grit and grind rivalry games, especially with Pittsburgh. Cincinnati's turned into a little something there. Cleveland, obviously, as well. So I think Baltimore has a shot to, to take the AFC North back in Cincinnati, but we'll see how it all plays out for them this year in 2023 but that's all i have for you here today on locked on nfl thank you so much for tuning in here be sure to subscribe on youtube follow along in order form as well free and available for you all podcasting platforms anywhere you get your shows when we get back here tomorrow more nfl content from your tuesday host so be sure to stay tuned for that we'll see you right back here tomorrow on locked on nfl